and welcome to Basic Folk, where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. It's Cindy Howes. Oh, hi. Thanks so much for joining us today. A couple of things before we get into our conversation with Miko Marx. If you have not yet supported Basic Folk, you can do so in several different ways. You can make a financial contribution at basicfolk.com slash donate. If you make a gift of $60 or a $5 a month gift, you can have access to Backstage, where you can find all of our very super cool exclusive bonus content. That's basicfolk.com slash donate to make your contribution. If you cannot contribute right now, that is A-OK with us and hope that um, you enjoy listening. Uh, you can follow us on social media at Basic Folk Pod. You can go to our website, basicfolk.com, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and tell your friends about this very enjoyable, wonderful, very cute folk podcast, Basic Folk. Okay, we're going to get into our conversation with Miko Marx. Her story starts in her hometown of Flint, Michigan, where she was immersed in music, specifically country music. Loretta Lynn and Kenny Rogers were in heavy rotation, and the music that she found in Black Church at the Church of God in Christ. As a young girl, she first sang live in that church and found the experience to be super overwhelming when she noticed that it was making members of the congregation weep. I don't blame you. She got more comfortable with performing when she recognized that it was only people responding emotionally to the music. It's important to keep in mind how talented a singer Miko Marks is. Her chosen sound is based in roots and country, but this woman can sing anything. She attended college at the Grambling State University, a historically black school in North Louisiana, full scholarship for singing. This fact will also lead you to her Erica Badu connection, which of course I asked her about, and of course, she has a very good story. Miko was living in San Francisco when she won a radio contest for singing. After that, her dreamboat firefighting ultra-supportive husband encouraged her to pursue a music career in Nashville. She went for it and started making some traction in the 2000s. To make a long story short, she found a lot of people that really, really loved her music, but she could not find a major label that would sign her because she was too, quote, innovative, which we can all assume is code for too black. She decided to not go after any major label dreams, focused on smaller musical projects, and stopped writing. That is, until she had a dream that she was playing with her former bandmates. She texted them both about the dream, they both responded, got together to play, recorded a few songs, then recorded Miko's first full-length album since 2007. 2021's Our Country was followed just recently by her EP Race Records, which focuses on country songs written by white men. The EP inserts this extremely talented singer, songwriter, and black woman into the songs that she loves. Miko Marx is graceful, generous, and holy cow, what a voice and what a spirit. Hope you enjoy. We're going to check out a song from Miko's album, Our Country. The song Ancestors actually kicks off the entire record. Very powerful tune. And then we'll get to our conversation with Miko Marx on Basic Ball. I hear a whisper hidden in the wind. Very happy to talk to you today, and I ha- I did a lot of research on you. You're an incredible person. Um, so you grew up in Flint, Michigan, immersed in country music. Uh, your grandma brought that passion with her when she moved there from Mississippi. So you were like in it. You were watching Hee Haw, listening to the Grand Old Opry, Loretta Lynn, Kenny Rogers, mm-hmm. household names. It was just simply like embedded into your upbringing. Looking back, like, what was it about the music that resonated with you? And since you spent a lot of time with your grandmother, how was music used in your family to connect with one another? Well, um, 
the music piece, my whole family is musical. Um, I grew up in the church singing gospel music primarily, and then I got into country music from my grandma. Um, she came straight up from Mississippi and brought all the music with her, and I would stay with her after school, and we'd listen, and she'd show me different records because early on, I guess I was about three or so, my grandma really thought I had a voice, and my mama did too. And um, But I, what resonated with me as far as country music was the instrumentation and the storytelling. I didn't mm -hmm. want, I didn't know at the time that I was really connected to the storytelling because I'm a kid who who wants to be told a story as a kid and so I really loved the messaging in the songs um, and just the the way it made me feel I would go on these journeys like in a song by Patsy Cline walking after midnight I could visualize that and I can see all the illustrations of in the song I could see I could picture it so it have mm. to, I'd have to say the storytelling and the instrumentation. So I read um, about, or I heard you talk about how some of your friends maybe didn't share that passion for country music with you when you no. were a kid. No, <laughs> no, no, um, no. Yeah. So what would you make of it when they would tell you, oh, country music is for white people? Well, I kind of was, I almost agree, but then I loved it, you know. And so I was like, yeah, you're right, you know, but I loved it. There was something in me that was drawn to the music. I didn't know until later on in life as I studied country music and got to know its history. I'm like, well, this is this is actually music that belongs to me. And so mm. once I found that out, everything kind of connected the dots for me on this real desire to, you know, seek out more music and learn more about it and actually participate in it. it. It made it more real for me to know that we were at the foundation of the genre being created. Mm, so powerful. All right. Here's a little bit of a setup to this question about church. Um, that's where you started singing at a young age. And uh, there's this article that talked about you singing the national anthem that they published in 2008 in the SF gate that said something um, that I was hoping that you could break down. Um, they said, Miko Marx splits the word wave into four syllables, revealing her roots in the black church. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Can you explain that a little bit more on a musical level? Um, on a musical level, there's there what we call runs, where you go, you know, where you can just do anything, bend and create dynamics with the voice. And so... I'm pretty sure they meant as far as like my inflection of the word. I just kept taking it up a half step, half step, half step, half step until it became mm -hmm. this big wave. Um, and that is something that I learned in the church from being a member of Church of God in Christ. And we, we as black people, we know how to take one note and turn it into 20. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure that's what they meant. Um, you also told a story of being like a little freaked out by people uh, crying, like being moved to tears in the congregation, watching you sing when you were a little kid. Um, so how did you come to realize that they were like responding emotionally to the music and how did that impact your relationship to performing? Um, it, it made me scared to perform. A lot of times I would have to be like coerced into doing it. Yes, it was a lot to take in as a young kid, and I didn't like it, um, be, but I didn't understand it. And then once my mama taught me about, you know, the healing uh, component brought through music, and she was like, these people are being healed, you're feeding their souls, and, you know, this is a good thing, you know. And she, she really helped me wrap my small brain around people being connected to the spirit and the voice that is using that. Mm. And so... I got a chance to really kind of be a vessel more so. And so when I mm. performed more, I took it as, okay, I'm just a vessel to, I'm being used in this way to touch people. And so I mm -hmm. kind of started to take a little bit of pride in it, but it was also very um, intimidating. I just didn't want to see people cry or fall out yeah. and do all the things and, but once I understood that it was actually a, a good connection to the soul and the spirit, then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm being used by God to do something good. 
Hmm. That also seems like it would be hard if you were like a very empathetic little kid. You know? Yes, yeah. I was Trying very to abs- absorbing kid. people's yes. emotions. Yeah. And I still do that today. <laughs> Cut it out. Stop it. <laughs> I can't uh, not do it either. Um, so I, I know I know how you feel. Um, that story also makes me think that when you were at that age singing music in the church, that music was an authentic expression of yourself as soon as you got comfortable with it. Um, so what has been your musical journey of like performing music that like felt right when you were young, then mu- making music that didn't feel right when you were a little bit older, when you first uh, went to Nashville in the early 2000s? And then like returning to your younger self again, what th- what that process felt like and how maybe it made you feel connected to your younger self? Well, I want to say that um, when I did music early on, it was, it was kind of like um, I was disconnected. I was just doing the things that, you know, that we did in my family. We all sang in the choir. And then when mm-hmm. I moved, when I went to Nashville to record, I wouldn't say I did music that didn't resonate with me. I was mm-hmm. at a different space in my life. And so I was singing about different things and uh, writing about different subject matters. Um, but now as a 49 year old woman, I have a different story to tell, different experience to elaborate on. I want to speak to, I want my music to speak to the times. Um, mm-hmm. I'm less worried about what people think I should do and I'm more concerned with what my heart is telling me to do. Mm. You went to college at Grambling State University in North Louisiana, full scholarship. Yes. Very good. Uh, For singing? For um, vocals, yeah. So you were surrounded by, it's a historically black school, um, and you were surrounded by other musicians who were black, which had probably maybe been the case up to that point. And you went on to pursue country music in the 2000s. What was the experience like for you to be like surrounded like by people who look like you performing music and then walking into a situation where you might be the only black person in the room? Well, I have to um, go back a little bit in time because I had a really colorful um, high school experience. I um, mm-hmm. I was surrounded by white people for the most part in my school. And uh, we had a choir called the Magicals and we went to Carnegie Hall and sang opera style music at the age of 15. So I want to say that I say that because I have a, a full spectrum of musical experience and different different people in my mm. life. So I wasn't just surrounded by black people doing music. But Grambling did expose me to the backward country radio stations, the blues stations that were on. So I still felt a connection to the music, even though I was in uh, a people of color environment and university. I've always stretched myself outside the limits. Cool. I like that. Um, all right. I want to hear about your friendship with Erica Badu. Well, this, that story is pretty funny because I did not know Erica when we got to college. Um, I had started a music group called Harmony, and we were practicing in a theater. Erica comes running around the corner, well, walking casually, and she joins in on our song, which was, I think it was an In Vogue song um, back in the 90s. And she started singing with us. We didn't invite her. But she started singing, and (laughs) after she was done, we were like, you want to be in our group. And so, hence, our friendship began from that moment. And she would travel back to Michigan to sing at my mom's church with me, and we're still friends today. I love it. Um, You live in the Bay Area in California with your husband, a retired firefighter who sounds like a real dreamboat. Um, Yeah. You you won a radio singing contest, and he actually is the one that convinced you to pursue country music in Nashville. Um, what was that like, and what has it been like to have such a supportive partner pushing you, and what was his role in the lead-up to our country's release earlier this year? Well, he has been an integral part of my evolution as far as, like, I worked in San Francisco as a legal secretary. He told me to quit my job and pursue music full time. 
And at that point, it was put upon me like, okay, do you want to do this? Or are you just going to not do this? So I felt a calling to do what I needed to do musically. And I tell you, I haven't worked a day job since. Um, I've been able to do my music full time. and But I stopped for a long time because I just, I stopped recording. I continued to do gigs and shows around the area and maybe do a little bit of traveling. But as far as actually recording, I stopped. Hmm. And so now coming into our country, that was just such a spiritual experience. I had a dream about, you know, just making music, no record or anything, just playing with these two guys, Justin Phipps, Steve Wireman, who, um, who are the producers of our country. And they brought one song to me and said, hey, we, we have this song, it's called Goodnight America. It, it's far from what you've done before, but take a listen and see if you want to do it. And immediately, my soul wanted to do the song. Now, go back 2008, maybe I wouldn't have wanted to do the song. But mm -hmm. after all the life experiences... Why not? Well, because I was young then, and I was a little more happy-go-lucky. I always saw the glass half full. So I really, it wasn't in my wheelhouse as far as subject matter, because I was just so green as an artist. I think I, think I would have thought that was too heavy of a subject matter for me at that time. Mm. But not today. So in in uh, hearing the story about the dream of you and your former bandmates just playing together in a dream and then you explaining the story that you texted them and then they presented you with Goodnight America and they also were just starting up this nonprofit record label at the time, Red Tone, it seems like your timing was like absolutely incredible and wondering like how did that experience make you feel about fate or divine intervention? This, um, this whole project is divine intervention. It is literally out of my hands. It's happening all on its own. And that's how I know that it's bigger than me. Um, because we had no intentions of doing a record, but we kept making song after song until midway. Mm -hmm. We were like, uh, we should probably do an album. And then <sighs> COVID hit. So it made it even more, um, it made it to where we could sit down, focus, write our truths, write our hearts out, and really create something meaningful and beautiful. And I tell you, my career was dormant for like uh, 13 years, and then COVID hit, and all of a sudden, things are great. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, everything happens for a reason, and um, I definitely feel like this project and the people that I'm working with is an anointed time in my life and spiritual experience. I want to go back to um, Nashville Mika 1.0 back in the 2000s where you had, uh, you came to Nashville and you were like trying to make it uh, on a, you know, in the, in the country mainstream. Um, but also in that era, you had a team of people telling you what to wear, the cowboy hat, the boots, uh, how to wear your hair to actually wear it as a, in a weave. Um, you were also making music that was trying to fit into this box. So like after the dust had settled, what did that teach you about being brave and staying true to yourself? Um, the thing I, I wrote seven of the 10 songs on my first album, Freeway Bound. So they were my truth at the time, at that mm -hmm. time in my life. They were my experiences. Um, I wrote about finding my way home, which is a song about just finding your purpose in life. And so I was in a in a experimental stage at that point mm -hmm. and um when i got to nashville i just thought hey if you're good and the music's good you're gonna make it well it's not that easy and um i was a little disheartened by the the entire experience um i performed at country music fest every year 2005 six seven i believe those are the years and then they changed the criteria to where you had to chart on billboard, you had to sell this many units, and it got to be to where it was just, um, I was boxed out. And so I just had to take my ball and go home, <laughs> so to speak. Mm. It's a wild story. So it sounds like, I wanna go back to the hats, the boots, and the weave. It sounds like that physical appearance 
were kind of suffocating for you so much that you shaved your head. Um, yes. And it seems like you use your hair as an act of expression and in that situation, an act of rebellion. How do you continue to use your hair as a form of expression? Well, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm creative with it now. I don't think I need to fit into this box, you know, of long wavy hair. No, I wear dreadlocks. I wear froze. You know, I'm, I cut my hair to really get back down to my true authentic self. And it was empowering. I love that, Miko. I may do that again. And you talked about um, lightheartedness that you radiated in your music, when, like back in Miko 1.0, if that's what, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. a good name for her or not, but. Yeah. Um, so now you, I found this quote that says, You've, I've experienced so much that I can't afford to be lighthearted anymore. So it's kind of like, I don't know if this is the case and, in I'm looking at it sort of as a, from a negative perspective. It's like when you recognize that that youthfulness is gone. Um, what was it like for you to recognize that you couldn't be as lighthearted in your music anymore? And what does your light look like now? And how do you hold on to it? It, it was empowering, you know, like really empowering. And I'm still lighthearted in a lot of ways, you know, but there is so much going on in our country and in the world that to not sing about these things or to not speak to them or, you know, um, use my voice as a conduit for the messaging, then what am I doing? You mm, know, I, right. I feel purposeful in my music now. There are many examples, so this is a little bit of a setup, of you honoring black women and men who have preceded you in country music, um, just to name a few, Linda Martell, Joanna Neal, uh, Ruby Falls, giving support and accolades to your contemporaries. There's this wonderful story of you sending Reese Palmer flowers. You did not even know her in 2007 at her Opry debut, and now to paying it forward for like up-and-coming black women in country music. Mickey Guyton, Brittany Spencer. And I see that attribute flowing through the current movement of black women and men in country music. So what can you say about this positive support approach versus one that's based in like jealousy or like, woe is me or like that should have been me? Right. It's welcome. I, I, I think there's a lot of sun to shine on everyone. You know, it doesn't have to be one person. It can be us all, you know, um, I really like to see what I'm seeing right now in, in um, our support of one another. I've always been this way because whoever it is, I want to shine a light on you in any way that mm. I can, you know. And so me not knowing Reese didn't, she deserved flowers. She deserved to see another person see her. And I feel mm. the same about Britney Spencer, about all the women, Raina Roberts, you know, Willie Jones, all the great people that are out there now. I support everyone, everyone, because they're doing their work and they're doing their art and they're sharing it in a way that is to be congratulated. Hmm. So the album Our Country that came out earlier this year, um, the I, f I see the title as being multifaceted, but can you talk about the significance of a title like Our Country? It's twofold. It means that this country belongs to me, but it also means this country belongs to us. Now, how do we reconcile me and us? Like, and it's clear that we are separated and divided right now as a country on many levels. So um, it was really just titled that to reinforce that this country belongs to all of us. So how can we begin to exist in a peaceful, harmonious way together? Hmm. The song Our Ancestors, you said you wrote it as a call for spiritual strength and a return to our roots. We know that if our ancestors survived the hardship and suffering they endured, their power to overcome is alive within us, which is beautiful writing. Um, how do you stay connected to your ancestors and reflect on their power within yourself? I stay connected through prayer and meditation. Like, honestly, that's what I do to stay connected. In all things that I do, I try to listen to the spiritual voices that are around me, like my great-grandmother, like my grandfather, all the people that are in my family that have gone on. 
people that have been little angels of wisdom along the way that may not have been in my family. So I call mm-hmm. on their energy to strengthen and support and uplift and tell me which way to go, basically. Hmm. Uh, your version of Stephen Foster's Hard Times on Our Country was based on Mavis Staples' rendition. So I'm from Pittsburgh, where uh, Stephen Foster is actually born. So there's a, um, a little bit more of a light shined on him than in other places. Mm-hmm. Recently, uh, within the last couple of years, they took a statue down of Stephen Foster um, because it was a statue of him, and then underneath him, there were some black people kind of like looking up at him that mm-hmm. was in- incredibly inappropriate and offensive, and it was finally taken down. Um, so he has kind of um, uh, a difficult history, um, and minstrel music in general has a difficult history of, of racism. So can you talk about the significance of somebody like Mavis Staples covering that song, given that history? I love that Mavis covered that song. She repurposed it. She repurposed the history of Stephen Foster in a way. You know, he did the minstrel shows. And he had such a tragic life, you know, to die at such a young young age like that. But to take a song written by a racist, you know, and repurpose it to shine your light through the song, I was really in awe of Mavis and I wanted to do it too so we can have a deeper vetting in that Mm. repurposing zone. So that cover and your new EP Race Records sees you performing songs that were kind of seen as music for a white audience um, if I'm getting the concept correct. Mm -hmm. Um, Monroe Brothers, Bluegrass Music, Willie Nelson and the Carter Family Country Music. Um, Creedence Clearwater Re- Re- Revival, also a lot of male musicians um, mm-hmm. on here. Um, what was it like for you to insert yourself as a black person and as a woman and inserting your like genreless sound into these songs? It was healing. It was invigorating. And I did want to take songs done by all these male white men and repurpose them and put, put a different voice through the same messaging. And um, we called it race records because, as you know, um, when the genre was first started, hillbilly music was for whites, race records was for blacks. But if you listen to the instrumentation of all of these songs, there's blues, roots, there's gospel, there's country, all blended in there. And um, I wanted to do an EP that reflected a time where the genres were less defined. Mm. When you learned about that history of race records, um, how did it change your perspective on genres for music? Well, I've always been a genreless kind of person. I try not to pigeonhole myself into anything, but I get pigeonholed anyway. It's just a, music is a melting pot. Like for us to categorize and say, this belongs here and this belongs there, it's very limiting. So for me, just trying to be true, authentic self and not really think about genre so much is it causes my music to elevate itself your go in nashville did not see you reaching the commercial success uh that you were going for because of the town's aversion to pushing anything that's not white or straight or basically like anything that's not the status quo but there were believers on the outskirts of the mainstream um, there were people that were believing in your music that worked with you, gave you praise and courage, coverage. And once you released Our Country, they were there again with, you know, premieres on CMT, coverage in lots of elite press like Billboard. What can you say about the early believers that remained loyal when you came back on their radar? Um, I'm grateful, very thankful to have had the people that believe in me continue to do so. But we are at a time right now, there's a a reckoning going on in the music industry. And um, I think some people are very supportive of change in the industry. And so it has to be systemic. Um, I'm grateful for the the time that our country is getting and race records is um, really taking off. And so I think people are listening now more so than they were before. Mm. 
and it's spreading and that's a good thing. Plus the music is so good. It's so good. You. <laughs> uh, you had this quote that says, um, I'm just taking this day by day as it comes, really trying to slow the moment down and enjoy the music that we're creating. So you are indeed having a moment. How's that going? Like slowing it down, enjoying and staying present. It's going really well. Um, this is my life, you know, and so I every day I wake up and I'm thankful that I get to do music. Like Sunday, I'm opening for Paula Cole in Portland. That's going to be amazing. And I mm. haven't, I've never done an opening act, you know, so this is going to be my first and it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. And so we're driving up, we're not flying, we're driving up, we're slowing things down. We're taking the time to maybe write, discuss some songs and, you know, just keep, keep being present, you know, in mm -hmm. the moment of everything that's going on because things are going pretty fast, but I try to slow things down because things are really good not right now. So why not? And will you make a band with fantastic Negrito? I don't, he's got his own thing going. He's, he's a great, great musician in and of himself. I just, I was so grateful that I had the opportunity to do that song and it happened by chance. I mean, he knows we have a mutual friend and she was just bragging on me about being in Billboard. And he was like, she sings country? And she's like, yeah, you should listen. And then that's how it took off. And he, I went into the studio to do one song. I walked out of there after doing four songs. And there's more. We're just, yeah, there's more. And so that was like all these little God shots have been happening around me. And so that was just one of them. You have to explain what a God shot is. A God shot is when you're not trying to do anything. And and all of a sudden, all this goodness comes your way, like unbeknownst to you. You know, you didn't put any effort. Nobody, you know, it's just all these little things that come together, just shoot you in the arm like, Psh, that's God. <sighs> like, that's what it is for me. Oh, I love it. Um, Miko, before we go, will you do the lightning round? Okay. I don't All know right. What it is, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for someone who's lost their lightness, you're very positive. <laughs> yep. uh, first song you learned on the guitar. Yankee Doodle. Karaoke song. I will always love you. Oh, great. Um, dogs or cats or something else. Dogs. What is your coffee order? Almond milk. Mavis Staples or Aretha Franklin. Both. Both. <laughs> yeah. You cannot That's do right. that. <laughs> First celebrity crush? Matthew McConaughey. Woo. <laughs> Who is the nicest musician you've ever met? Nice Stevie Wonder. Hmm. Uh, first album you bought with your own money? DeBarge. First concert? New Kids on the Block. <sighs> Unexpected, but great. Um, mm -hmm. Do you remember the concert? I want to hear more about this. No, I don't remember. I went with a bunch of my friends and they were playing in Detroit, so we drove an hour to get to the concert. Wow, must have been so epic. It uh, was. Fl flying or invisibility? Invisibility. Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Trek. Last one, where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? That just happened recently, Zion National Park. Great answer. All right, Miko, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm glad we got a chance to do it. Me too. Basic Folk This Week was produced by Sarah Siplak. Our music is composed by Alex Stanton of Townspeople. Basic Folk is proud to be on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. I'm Cindy Howes. Thanks for checking this podcast out. And if you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. We really appreciate it, and it really helps to spread the word about this pod. Okay, uh, you can listen to this podcast wherever you found this episode or at basicfolk.com. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. Bye.